Out of the depth have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice, and let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel out of all his iniquities. God is good, and all the time. Let's try that one more time. God is good. And all the time, Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good. I often say, when he blesses us, he's good. And we'll all say amen to that. Not as many people say amen to this statement. When he punishes us, he's also good. When he answers our prayers, he's good. When he does not, he's good. The Bible says in Psalm 145, verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. In other words, God cannot do anything wrong. Can you say amen? amen. And so God is truly good, and I thank him for that. How was your day? Good. good. Did you represent God well? <laughs> You're humble, so you're not sure. <laughs> okay. Well, you look as if you did, so that's fine, that's fine. Is there anyone present? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? Anyone? <laughs> All right. And you come here for the first time, of course. All right, no first-timers. Well, welcome to all of you. And for those who are watching online, Thank you very much for being with us. The Spirit of God is not hampered or hindered or held back by whether we're online or in a building. The Spirit of Christ is everywhere. And so he represents the Lord wherever we worship him. So thank you for connecting online. Our subject for today, tests and trials. What did I say? Tests, tests and trials, something that we do not like but something that is absolutely essential for anyone who has a desire to enter God's kingdom. Before I get to that message, let me ask you please, if you're not using your phone or your tablet or anything else that makes a noise, make sure it is turned off so that there's no disturbance in the house of God. I hope you find that request reasonable. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And say, who has prayed for me so far since we started on... Ah, may the Lord bless you endlessly. May the Lord bless you. And that's a prayer with my eyes open. May the Lord bless you. And for those of you who have not yet prayed, tonight is as good a time as any to say, Lord, that man is struggling, which he always is. Please put your words in his mouth. It is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words, my words, in thy mouth. And that's all I want to speak, the words of God. Favor number three, think as you listen. Reason within yourselves under the guidance of the Spirit of God. Isaiah 1.18, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's reason, says God. I thank God he's a reasonable and a reasoning God. You know, Mark 12, 28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, Jesus reasoned with his audience. Um, Acts 17 and Acts 18 and Acts 24, Paul reasoned. As Christians, we must reason as we present truth. We serve a God who loves to reason. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, someone equal with yourself, Someone, Lord, who said, let there be light, and someone who said on the cross, it is finished. Someone who said to John on the Isle of Patmos, 
I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore in his name. The name of the one who said, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. In the name of the one who said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. In his name, we come to you and we ask you first, quickly, Father, if you see anything unlike you in us, remove it, dear God, with the divine detergent of the blood of your son. Cleanse us, dear God. A deep cleaning, Father, not just the surface. Put within us a love for righteousness, just because it's right, because that's the way you are. Bless all those who've come, every family, every guest, Bless those online, their Father. Let the message you give to me bless everyone in his or her particular circumstances. Father, I pray again for anyone who may have contracted the coronavirus. In the precious, powerful name of Jesus, heal those persons, dear God. Touch them and heal them just because you do not like to see suffering. Now, Father, put your words in my mouth. Grant me the humility of Jesus and let me listen when the Spirit tells me say that or don't say that. Let me listen that you might be glorified and your people blessed. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen. What's our subject? Test. Ah, that was quick. Test and trials. It is, uh, looks like a little after 6.15. I'll release you by 7. Genesis 2, reading from verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 16. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, reading that passage I have read more times in the, in the, in the pulpit, I suppose, than any other passage of Scripture. Genesis 2, 16, 17. When you found it, say amen. amen. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. This was a test, a test for sinless people. Let me say immediately, if sinless people needed a test, what about sinful people? Adam and Eve were tested by God. Adam and Eve did not ask God to make them. He just made them. But they had to let him know that they're glad, they love him more than anything else, and that they wanted to remain in a sinless environment. They had to demonstrate that individual choice. And so God said, of every tree of the garden. God is a very, as we said, reasonable. Now, if you read Genesis 1.29, it says, And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth. Hmm? Fruit trees weren't only in the Garden of Eden. They were all over the earth. And remember, God gave Adam dominion over all the earth. So Adam could have gone for a walk, a nature walk, and taken of any fruit tree on the earth. Now, of all the trees on this planet, when God made it, God reserved one for himself. You didn't hear what I said. God could have said, Adam, all the trees are mine except one. That one's yours. God reversed it. All trees are available to you except one. Now, that's an easy test to pass, you would think. Child Guidance, page 79, paragraph 5, Ellen White writes, It was the least test the Lord could devise. The Lord could give the holy pair in Eden. It was the least test. And in Christ's triumphant, page 20, paragraph 6, he fell under the smallest test that God could devise to prove his obedience. It was an easy test. Let me extend my dealing with God's goodness. God tells you and me, you've got $100, give me 10. Hmm? Could God ask for 90? Yes, because all 100, come on, is his. Unless you can prove you invented gold and silver and crude oil and whatever else constitutes wealth. 
God tells us, you hold on to 90, give me 10. And God can't get that 10. God is so good. And we're talking about tests and trials, but I like to talk about the goodness of God. God said, look, I made seven days. You take six. Give me one. Ah, you don't love God. You're not saying anything. Come on, can somebody say amen? God said, you take six. Give me one. And people say, no way. I mean, it's, God is good. And all the time. I love God. God is a nice person. I love him and I like him. As I was telling the pastor, I believe, there are some relatives we don't particularly like, but we have to love them because they don't. <laughs> we're always glad when they don't visit. We, don't, we love them, but we don't necessarily like them. But I like God and I love God. Anyway, we go back to the test of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. A test for perfect people. Adam sinned. And we have sinful people now. We come into this world inheriting a nature that prefers to rebel against God. It, is, it leans in the direction of obedience, disobedience. That's the way we are born. Now, here's what God says to us. Let us go to uh, Mark chapter 12. We'll read from verse 28. Our subject, test and trials. God had to prove Adam, and Adam failed. God still has to prove us. Because we're preparing for a world where there will be no more sin. Do you have Mark 28? Not 28, sorry, Mark 12, reading from verse 28. Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, please tighten your grip on all my faculties. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one God, one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now listen again. With all thine heart. Not some of it. With all. Now, love God with the heart. But here's what the Bible says about that organ. The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. How can that heart love God? But the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. God has to put that in us, then we express it. We love him because he first loved us. And so Jesus told that scribe, and he's telling us, we must love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Now, listen to how the psalmist summarizes that without knowing he's summarizing it because it wasn't written in his time. Go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Here's one verse that sums up all of that beautifully. Psalm 103. You've probably read it several times as I did before noticing what I'm about to say. Psalm 103, reading verse 1. I'll let you read it for me. What does verse 1 say? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and... Thank you. Say it again and stress the word I'm looking for. And all that is within... Now, what's in within you? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. In Deuteronomy 6, all your might. And in Mark 12, 33, all your understanding. With everything within you, love me. Now, if I were to say, how many of you love God? All hands would go up. And they always go up. But you see, we are saved by faith. But how are we judged? By works. In other words, God says, you say you love me, fine. I take you at your word, let me test it. 
Doesn't John 14, 15 say, if you love me, come on, keep my commandments. There must be a test. And this love for me must be so strong now, it will survive in the new world to come. Ah, uh, you didn't hear what I said. This love for me now, this devotion to me, this total surrender to me, it must be of such a concentrated completeness that it will survive for an eternity. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Before we go to Job 1, let's go to Exodus 20. What's Exodus 20 well known for? The commandments, yes. Very good. We have Exodus 20, book number 2, chapter number 20. You read from verse 1 to 3. Do you have that? And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, read verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Keep in mind, God is telling that to a people who just came out of what country? Which was the powerful country then. The Egyptians worshipped the sun. The hawk, the crocodile, the cat, the dog, the hyena. <laughs> if it moved, the, the Egyptians worshipped it. Are you following me? They came out of a polytheistic society and God is saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now don't take that to mean... God first, then you worship the snake, the hawk, the sun. No, no, no. You must have one God, and that's me. In other words, your, your affections, your intellect, your strength, whatever all that makes you who you are must be focused on me. It's not easy to do that, but it's easy to say it. God has to test our profession of faith. Now go to Job chapter 1. 27 after 6. We're in good time. Job chapter 1. We read from verse 6. A well-known incident in the Bible. Do you have Job? Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Written by Moses while he was in the wilderness for 40 years. I didn't say it contains the oldest information. I said it's the oldest book. Genesis contains the oldest information, the creation, but Job is the oldest book written in the Bible. You have Job chapter 1, reading from verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? What a privilege it is to have God bragging on you. Hmm? God is bragging, if I can use that term for God. Actually, God is the only one with the right to brag. Are you following me? Anyone who can say, let there be light and light comes, he can brag as much as he likes. And I will step off the stage and let him occupy that stage by himself and do all the bragging and get all the praise. And so God says, hast thou considered my servant Job? Hast thou considered my servants at Petersburg SDA Church? There's none like them in the United States. They fear me. They avoid evil. They love each other. There's no backbiting. There's no unrest. Have you considered my servants in St. Petersburg? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Ah. <laughs> Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth now thy hand. 
and take away something he has. And you'll see who you're dealing with. That man you just bribed on will leave you. I got a call, a text from a friend of mine who runs a health facility in a certain country on the face of the earth. And one of the clients is suffering from severe depression. When this person was in college, the person was strict about not taking exams on Sabbath. Other members of the church took exams on Sabbath. Because for many of us, education is a God that will take care of us in the future. And so we take exams on Sabbath. Because of her fidelity to God, things didn't go her way. She's depressed, threatening to leave God because God didn't do what she, didn't honor her faith. Jacob, Joseph, was faithful to God. Are you following me? He went to prison. God had to test Joseph to see how deep the roots of his commitment ran. This young lady, under test by God, is ready to leave God because God disappointed her. God does not disappoint. We disappoint God. Let me tell you something. The Lord has to bring a test into your life and mine to expose the genuineness of what we say with our lips. And so the devil said, put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has. Take away his material things. Take away his house. Take away his car. Give him the pink slip on the job and then see if he loves you. This is not meant to discourage you. It's meant to cause you to think twice and thrice. Only eight people entered that ark. In the days of Noah, eight. When Lot, in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, the cities of the plain, one righteous man escaped. The two daughters were not righteous. Righteous daughters don't sleep with their father after getting him drunk. Are you following me? The wife wasn't righteous. One righteous man from five cities. But I'm sure that before the fires fell, everybody loved God. And so the devil said, put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself. Put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day... Verse 13 of, Genesis, of Job 1, when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, a, a messenger came and said to Job, thy sons and thy daughter, the, 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 um, the oxen were plowing and the cattle feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans came and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell, alone to tell thee. Calamity number one. Now they all fell upon Job in one day. When God removes his hand from the devil a little bit, it is amazing how quickly calamity and catastrophe will come, one after the other. While he was yet speaking, verse 16, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and has consumed the servants and the sheep and burned up the servant and the sheep and consumed them, and I only am escaped to tell thee. The next calamity, 17, the camels were taken by the Chaldeans. Next calamity, all the sons and daughters killed in the house because a wind came, blew down the house, all 10 of them dead. Verse 20. Read verse 20 for me. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, come on, shaved his head, come on, fell upon the ground and left the church. And curse God and complain, why me? He worshiped God. The devil has to see, there's nothing I can do to that man 
that will turn him from God. The devil has to see that, and God has to show him that, but God shows that to him in our lives. Job stayed faithful to God. I cannot imagine the weight of sorrow Job felt. It is one thing to attend a funeral of one loved one. I'm told parents prefer to die than to bury their children. Bury all ten of your children at the same time. Listen, God can be rough. But God will do whatever is necessary to get us ready for that land. Are you following me? Chapter 2 of the book of Job. Let's pray again. Father, as I continue, let your spirit instruct me clearly. Grant me that humility to listen, Father. Speak through me, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Job chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, this is the second time now, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now finish verse 3 for me. And still, come on, he holdeth, come on, say it again, he holdeth fast. Stop. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What is God saying? Hmm? Hold it tight as if you value what you're holding, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Now finish the verse. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Still, you know, you see some things and all you can say is, mm, mm, mm. Because you know I would have left God a long time ago. Still, he holds fast. God had to test Job to the limit. So that Job, not that God can see anything that Job might see. We think we're faithful to God. We think we love God. And God says, fine, I accept what you say with your lips. Now let's look at the heart. You know what Jesus says? This people honoreth me with their, but their hearts are. I've had people say to me, I have bills. I have to work and sell. What am I supposed to do? Why are you asking me what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to obey God. That's all I can tell you. I don't mean to say it coldly or harshly. You, are, you see, obedience is not negotiable. You don't obey God conditionally if things are right. When I have everything I need, I'm the most faithful person to God. My house is paid for. My cars have gas. My children are in school. They're doing well. Everything is fine. I love Jesus. Take away one. And then, God says, see, not in order to point fingers, but to let his children know you need to come closer. You need to come closer. You are in danger of losing what I have prepared for you. When God called Abraham in Genesis 22 to kill Isaac. Let's go to verse, Genesis 22. Let's read verse 10. Genesis 22, reading verse 10. What's our subject? Tests Test and trials. 7.30, no. What time is that? Oh, 20 to 7. Do we have 20 minutes? Do you have Genesis 22? Amen. Let's read verse 10. What does verse 10 say? And Abraham did what? Stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him and said what? Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, what? Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. Now read the next few words. Now I know, come on, that thou, yes, go on. Seeing thou hast not withheld, come on, 
thy son, thine own. God says, now says God, I know. God pushed him to the limit. If you think Job's suffering was great, consider Abraham's suffering. Abraham represents God. Isaac symbolizes Jesus. Think of God's suffering in sending Christ. Eloise said Jesus had to ask God three times to come and die. Three times before the Father said yes. Not because the Father didn't love us, but it was not easy for the Father to give up his son. But he gave him up for you. When God told Abraham, Offer him there upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Genesis 22, verse 2. It wasn't easy for Abraham. Read the story in pictures and prophets. At night when Isaac was sleeping peacefully, trusting his father, Abraham was wrestling with God. That maybe this would not be necessary. God will ask you to give up that which is closest to you in order to serve him. You know why? God originally made us in his image. The image of God is to give up what's closest to him in order to save us. Are you following me? And God says, now act like me. Give up what's closest to you in order to benefit from my salvation. There must not be a shred of selfishness in the heart. Give it up. And we say, no way. I've met some people, usually young men, who had very uh, athletically gifted, were offered this, this, this to play professional sport, and they said no. They came to the truth, and they gave it up for truth. Let me tell you something. Anything you've given up for God would have been bad for you. Job chapter 2. You go back to verse 3. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath. Finish the verse. Will he give? Come on. For his life now. We go from possessions to life. Checking for my pulse. Life. Take my house, don't take my wife. You following me? Take my car, don't take my daughter. But didn't our son, our sin, take God's son, yes or no? Yes. yes. Our sin took his son. The devil is right. Skin for skin. All that a man hath will he give for his life. Our most precious possession is life. In Hebrews 2, 14, 15, just listen, no need to go there because we're coming back to Job. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, which is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage someone afraid of dying is in bondage and the devil knows that and so he threatens life when that threat comes we leave god daniel was tested and his life was on the line the three hebrew boys were tested their lives were on the line Daniel was tested twice, as far as the Bible goes. In chapter 1, he could have lost his life for not eating the king's recommended food. The recommendation came from Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar did not rule by committee. The Bible says, whom he would, he slew, and whom he would, he left alive. Daniel risked his life, along with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in Daniel 1. In Daniel 3, the three Hebrew boys, they risked their lives. And Nebuchadnezzar said in verse 15 of Daniel 3, Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackmilk, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, 
He shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, if it comes down to this, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us, deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king, but if not. <laughs> Sounds like Jesus. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, I want you to know. Too many times we leave people guessing. Our classmates at school, they guess, is he a Christian? Is she a Christian? Because he was at the same party where he was last night. Is he a Christian? I have a friend in Maryland, and he loves to do evangelism. And, uh, but before he became an Adventist, he was in the bars and the clubs and you know what people consider good life. And uh, some Adventist young people, someone came to minister to him, come to church and get baptized. He said, what church are you from? Adventist church. He said, why do you have to come to church? I see your people in the same clubs where I go. Why am I coming to church? Well, the person could say nothing. Absolutely nothing. So often, our colleagues on the job don't know we're Seventh-day Adventists who honor God and express that love by obeying his commandments, particularly the fourth, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If they don't know, we believe that our bodies belong to God and we're careful of what we eat, what we drink, what we inhale. They don't know that because we confuse them so that we might fit in. Those three boys said, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we want you to know, we will not serve. I am not taking that joint. I am not taking that beer. I am not taking whatever. Now do whatever you want to do. Tie them up, throw them in the thing. They had no clue they would be saved. But their salvation was not the point. The honor of God. Somebody say amen. The honor of God was their priority, not their lives. We must come to the place where the honor of God is more valuable to us than our own lives. Because our salvation was more important to Jesus than his own life. You didn't hear what I said. Our salvation was more important to Christ than his own life. Tests and trials, they have to come. So we can see how deep go the roots of my commitment to God. Are these just words eloquently spoken or am I really committed to God? And that is only made visible by a trial and a test. Before Adam sinned, some of you are in school, and someone were to ask you, uh, are you taking math? Yes. Are you good at math? Yes. Let me see your exam results. <laughs> are you following me? Show me your grade report. You tell your teacher, oh, I, I, Professor Smith, I'm enjoying your calculus class. I know everything. He gives an exam. <laughs> are you with me? He gives an exam. You want to serve in special forces? You know, special for those soldiers that go on missions no one else can carry out. Ah, the, they don't train by going to a series of picnics. Are you following me? The training is designed to expose what? Weaknesses. Because weaknesses, they burrow down into the soul and they occupy the lowest level. And it takes a real earthquake to bring them to the surface. Many years ago, I kept a garden. The back of our house, it was a summer, it was a particularly hot summer in Michigan. And so the other ground was parched and cracked like overbaked bread, like one British poet said. So I decided I'll water the ground to get it ready to plant carrots or something that would grow quickly. In Michigan, you have two months to grow anything. <laughs> and so I went out <laughs> and I began to water. And I went inside, came back, and the ground was dry. So I watered again. 
Went inside for whatever reason, came back, the ground was dry. I said, man, this thing is thirsty. So I watered and watered until it became a little lake. <laughs> While I was standing watching the water go down, up popped a frog. And he looked at me as though I disturbed him, then he hopped off into the bushes. But some frogs hibernate. And they're disturbed by water. As the seasons change, they, they, they come up. The water went down where he was <laughs> and disturbed him, and up he popped. Are you following me? That's the way God's trials are. They go down, they go down, they go down, and up pop this frog of hypocrisy, this frog of stinginess, this frog of whatever. Up pop all these little frogs. We were unaware they were sleeping in us. Are you a peaceful person? Oh, yes, I'm peaceful. Then someone runs into the back of your car. Hmm? And you are surprised that you were never peaceful. You see, we don't know ourselves. We think we do, we don't. But God does. And God has to show us in love that he might fix us. Tests and trials, they must Come, because you and I are preparing for a world where sin will never rise the second time. The Bible says in Revelation 22 verse 3, and there shall be no more curse because there shall be no more sin and no more death. We must want that now. As we look for the second coming of Christ, and I'm finishing. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We read that passage, uh, I think it was on Sabbath. 2 Timothy 4 Let's read 7 and 8. Our subject, test and trials, we're on the down slope of the message. 10 minutes to 7. Do you have 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, 7 and 8? All right, let me pray. Father in heaven, as I'm closing, continue to be with me, please. I sincerely ask of you, in Jesus' name, amen. I have finished. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me when? At that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And that love is obvious in the lifestyle. They love his appearing. It dominates the thinking. It affects how they spend money, where they live. Because nothing must interfere with readiness for the coming of Christ. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Do you have Hebrews 9? 27, 28. Read 27 for me. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, come on. And after this the judgment, so Christ was once what? Offered to? Of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Paul says, those that love his appearing. Paul says in Hebrews, to those that look for him. And that looking dominates their lives. Let me close the book as a visual symbol that I'm finishing. God has to test you. Your high school teacher tests you. Your college professor tests you. If you're studying medicine, you've got to take step one, step two, step three. At every stage in life, there is a test. You want to play for the NFL? You've got to go to the combines. Let's see what you're made of. This isn't peewee football. This is NFL. This isn't some baseball for six-year-olds. This is the, 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 the America's game. We have to test you. What are you made of? What's under that suit? The purpose of trials is not suffering. The purpose of trials is perfection. Get us right. Get us straight with God. I don't know what's going on in your life. I'm not asking. But whatever befalls you, there are two ways to suffer. One, God allows for our salvation. Two, we bring on ourselves. So Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4.15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Don't suffer by things you brought on yourself. But if you be reproached for the name of Christ, if he suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. 
Are you on the test by God? Don't answer me. Make up your mind to pass. When Jacob wrestled with God by the brook, midnight, he thought at first it was Esau come to kill him. He was fighting for his life. And when I read this story, tears come to my eyes. I imagine Jacob, dark of night. He thinks this is someone who came to either Esau or some assassin Esau hired, and he's struggling for his life. It's not a wrestling match with a, with a, with a, with a referee. He is struggling for his life. The person fighting with him touches him in the hip, dislocates his hip. Now he's fighting on one foot. And tears come to my eyes when I read that. It was Jesus Christ. Then the person said, let me go because it's almost daybreak. Jacob said, tell me what he said. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Now, the Lord has sent a trial into your life. Your time to wrestle. You tell God, no matter what you do to me, I'm not letting you go. I don't care what you allow in my life. I don't care what you send. I am not letting you go. We must say like Brother Job, though he slay me. Finish the verse. Yet will I trust him. That's the point to which God wants us to come. When we arrive at that point, God can call the devil and say, come. Have you seen that brother at St. Petersburg? Go test him. And God sits down with his cool drink in heaven and watches. Not bothered at all. But too many times when the devil comes after us, God is biting his nails. What's he going to do? <laughs> Will he leave me? God biting his nails. Because he can't trust us to be faithful. Make up your mind right where you sit. Tell God with respect. Father, regardless of what you do to me, I'm holding on to you. How many will tell God that right now? Can I see your hand? I'm holding on to you. I don't care what you do to me. I'm holding on to you. Stand up with me. And I mean it. I don't care what you do. You have to kill me to get me off you. I'm not letting you go. The devil tempted Christ in the wilderness. It was so terrible, he collapsed. God had to send angels to help him. Matthew 4, 11. There was no one around. Only wild animals, they couldn't help him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, it was so tough, he began to bleed through his skin. He sweat through his skin. God sent an angel because the disciples were sleeping. But Jesus, he hung in there because he saw you. Now, let's see God. Put a smile on his face and put a frown on the devil's face. Take it for God's sake. He has a reward for you that you cannot imagine. And one day, by the way, the greatest honor God can give you is to suffer for him. It's a strange honor. Nobody wants it. But the greatest honor God can bestow upon a man or a woman is to suffer for him. And so you're faithful at school and your friends laugh at you five days a week and you take it. You're harassed on the job and you take it. And God looks down and all the angels applaud. And God says, you see that mansion? That's for him. I will only let him be tried in so, so far as he can take it. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, they have no temptation taken you. The word temptation means trial. But such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. Meaning you can take it. It's a biblical guarantee. You can take it. Believe that word and take it. I went to the dentist to have a procedure. He stuck a needle up my mouth and I felt it at the root. And I, ooh, he said, hang in there for me. I said, hang in there for you. He said, hang in there for me. That's what he said. And I'm there trying to look like a ninja warrior. And he, ooh, ooh. But I hung in there and finally he did what he had to do. And God says to us, the needle has gone to the root of your life. And you feel the pain. And he says to my son with our head in his arms, hang in there for me. 
because my name is on the line universally. Hang in there for me, says God. I know you lost the job. Hang in there for me. Head bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, life is not always easy, but you never promise easy life. You promise power to live the life you would have us to live. Dear God, help us to understand that tests and trials come to every living human being because you are preparing us for a life in which sin cannot rise the second time. We have to come to the place, Father, where our commitment to you is more than 100%. All our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, all our might, all our understanding. Psalm 103, verse 1, I will bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Let this be our posture tonight. Let this be our choice. Like Jacob, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Like Job, ah, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Like Jesus, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Give us that mindset, dear God. Let us not collapse under every trial, however heavy and hot it may be. Give us strength to endure. Because somewhere in us, we really do love you. But as you said in your own word in Psalm 103, verse 14, he knoweth our frame. He remembers that we're dust. And dust tends to panic. Dust cries. Dust tends to regret. But Father, you made us from dust. But fill us with your spirit, that spiritual gold. Sustain us tonight. Sustain us tonight that we may sleep knowing all is right between you and us. Hear the Spirit of God. I offer from my heart, in Jesus' name, let God's people say, amen, amen. and amen. Amen. If everyone would turn in their hymnals to page 213, we're going to sing, Jesus is coming again. We're going to sing it like we know it and believe it. Amen? Amen. Before I offer the benediction, 
in the book, I believe it's Evangelism, page 375, Ella White writes, when a soul is truly reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. I say that to say there may be someone listening who has been listening. As you look at your life and how you've lived it, you realize you may need to be rebaptized to start all over with God again. If that's a conviction, if that's going on in your mind, let us know. There may be someone who's not yet made a decision to be baptized and follow Christ with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and might. If that's your decision under the conviction of God's Spirit, let us know. As I said last night, I'm not calling anyone because of obvious restrictions, but I want you to know if the Spirit is working in you, respond because He will not always speak forever. If you have drifted from God, you know you've drifted and He knows you want to come back, let us know, and we'll guide you as to proper steps to take. But do not avoid making a decision, especially to come back and start all over with God again. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Sometimes the word isn't easy, but it's always saving when received by faith. If I said anything I shouldn't have said, if I was too hard with your people, forgive me, dear God, and speak to me tomorrow. Give me exactly the message to glorify your name and to bless your beloved people. As we go, let us reflect on what we heard. Let us, Father, renew the commitment we made by standing. Father, like Job, I will say, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Father, like uh, Jacob, I'll say, I will not let you go except you bless me. And like Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Give us that determination and renew it every waking moment of our lives. Watch over us tonight. Bring us back tomorrow to this place that we may continue these meetings with the, considering how quickly the days are flying. Bring us back tomorrow, Father, with those whom we invite. Bless those online. Watch over us tonight, I pray, from my heart. In Jesus' name, let God's people say amen, amen and amen. Sleep well. Dream of Jesus if you can. We will see you tomorrow.